most popular verse in the Bible, uh, how people know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, how people know amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. All um, gospel. Jesus loves the world. God loves the world. He wants to see people saved. He will give people that opportunity. He gives us that opportunity to bring people into that knowledge. But um, sing those words. I tell you, don't just, don't just um, follow along and just singing just for the sake of singing because we're singing, but think about what, what we're saying. Think about the words that are being put on the screen. Well, not today, but um, just uh, focus on the truth of those uh, songs. We pick songs very specifically on purpose uh, for a reason that have great messages inside of them. You might get nothing from the sermon but you might get something from a song one day. And uh, listen to those songs on your own. Sing those songs on your own. John chapter 4, and we will start uh, in the beginning of the verse, or beginning of the chapter, and we'll read up through a certain point. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea, departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. I'm going to focus on that verse there, verse 4, he must needs go through Samaria. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the blessing of your word. Thank you for your people, God, who are here to hear it preached. God, I ask that your word be magnified. I ask that nothing about me resonate today, God, but only the words that you give to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, John chapter 4, we see Jesus is, there was a little bit of conflict happening between these disciples of John and Jesus, and John had been cast into prison, and Jesus decides that he's going to avoid creating a controversy here, and uh, he decides that he's going to take a different route and go somewhere else. And so we see he, le- he leaves Judea and he departs into Galilee. But verse 4, it gives a very interesting uh, verse, and I like the way that it's said, and it says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Jesus had a purpose that he was going to make this journey, and he was going to make the journey in the direction that he decided to go. you got to understand Samaritans, and most of you are familiar with this, but Samaritans were not a popular group of people among the Jews. They were a mixed race um, of Jewish, mixed with some other uh, pagan um, cultures, and the Jews saw them as half-breeds. They saw them as mutts, which, uh, you know, that's what we all kind of are in America now. But um, they were this, this mixed race of people that were just absolutely disgusting in the eyes of the Jewish people. Um, and they were not, not to be associated with. You didn't go into Samaria. You didn't go that route, ever. If you were a Jewish person, you took the long way around. You didn't bother even go through the city. You didn't associate with the people. You didn't, they wouldn't even share the same vessels. They would refuse to do that. But Jesus makes a statement here, or the, or the Word of God makes a statement here, and it says, and he must needs go through Samaria. Samaria was the quickest route to where he was attempting to go. However, that wasn't the reason necessarily that he decided to go that direction or the only reason he decided to go that direction. See, Jesus had a purpose, and he had a plan for what he was going to do. Read with me verse number 5. Uh, chapter 4 there, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. So we see Jesus is going to stop at this well. I love just the way that this story sets up. Jesus going through Samaria. He's going to go and he's going to sit at this well. And I think to myself, knowing the God that I know, I think to myself, how long was this appointment scheduled for? At what point in, in this, the, the timeless being that is God did he decide one day, Jesus, my son, he, did he decide in his infinite wisdom that he was going to go sit at a well in a city that was despised by the Jewish people and despised by many people. Um, these, these people they called dogs. He was going to sit at this well because he had a specific purpose, and a specific plan, a divine, a 
disappointment. And there, uh, in verse number 9, Then saith the woman unto, uh, of Samaria unto him, How is it thou that, that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. This woman has surprised herself. Why would you even speak to me? Why are you even here? First off, you're a Jew. What are you doing here? And why would you even bother to speak to me? We see these people had a very good understanding that they were not wanted. And they were not um, people that were cared about. She knew. And it had been so just commonplace and acceptable that she was amazed that Jesus would even talk to her. Yet Jesus strikes up this conversation. Not only does he uh, begin to talk to her, not only is he in her city and he begins to have this conversation with her, he asks her for something to drink. You know, it's like I told you before, the Jews and the Samaritans, you didn't share a vessel. That was like defilement. I wouldn't even dare drink from the same vessel that you have drank from. I wouldn't touch it as a Jew. But Jesus asks the woman for a drink, and she's amazed. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up unto everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go, and call thy husband, and come hither. So we see Jesus, and, and we've heard the story before, he proposes to her that he has this water for her to drink, that she will never thirst again. And she's interested. What is this you speak of? What are you talking about? This water that you can give me. And he was obviously setting, up and, uh, setting her up, and we know what the plan was here. We know what the purpose that Jesus had in mind was, and that was the gospel. Imagine being given the gospel by the Savior himself, by the Messiah himself, as a Samaritan woman. As I read the story, I, I ask myself a couple questions. This meeting that Jesus decided that he was going to have with this woman one day, as I read the story, and like I said, I'm amazed that this appointment was set, I imagine it in my own life, and I think the, I think the same way on, in, in terms of my own life. But I ask you the same question, where did Christ meet you? At what point? Where did he go? What circumstances did he use? What situations did he put into your life to bring you to him? What divine appointment was met because Christ loved you that much? What trials, maybe? What person, what neighbor, what friend, what coworker? I don't know what the situation was, but at some point, as you sit in this room today, at some point you know that God sent somebody or put something in your life to draw you to Him because He had a purpose for you. He had a plan for you. He had living water that He wanted to give to you. And I see this Samaritan woman that He had a divine appointment with. That woman had no idea her life would be changed that day. Such was the case in my life. When I went to Sunday school as an eight and nine year old boy, and I sat in the in the Sunday school class, and uh, my parents had you know I had been in church, I went to church my whole life, but I, I in my mind I, my parents had told me that my dad had talked to me about salvation, but I just I just was you know okay yeah I, I guess I did, but I didn't remember it. I remember clear as day sitting in that Sunday school class, and I could take you to the room right now. Uh, I could see the room in my mind when I bowed my head and I, I heard my Sunday school teacher go through the gospel. And as a little boy, eight or nine years old, uh, nine years old I would have been at the time, I accepted Christ as my Savior. And I think God in all of His infinite wisdom, the Creator God, created a divine appointment for a nine-year-old boy in a Sunday school class with about uh, ten other kids. Because one day, He would have a purpose for that boy. He would have a plan for his life. And I think it's no different for each one of us in here. 
at some point you know, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God sent somebody into your life or a purpose into your life because he was there to meet you for that appointment, just like he did that Samaritan woman. She didn't get up that morning expecting to meet the Messiah at a well, so we would be talking about it 2,000 years later. She had no idea how much her life would be changed that day, folks. Nor did we the day that Jesus came into our hearts and into our lives and changed us. We probably didn't wake up that day preparing for that situation, but it happened. Unbelievable that the divine creator God would set an appointment for a lowly, sinful, Samaritan woman to be saved. But I say the same, it is unbelievable that 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 divine creator God would set an appointment for each one of us in here today. Secondly, what condition were you in? What condition were you in? Who were you that Jesus reached out to save you? She was a Samaritan woman. They called them dogs. This is how they were described. These were disgusting people in the eyes of the Jews. Hated. Absolutely hated. So many times Jesus uses stories about the Samaritans to teach lessons. But not only was she this Samaritan woman, she was a Samaritan woman with an immoral past. Look with me, if you will, back at the scriptures where we left off in verse number, uh, I'm sorry, uh, where were we? Sixteen, got it. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said. Like, you're right, you don't have a husband, do you? For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sayest thou truly. Jesus goes to her, and we see this was a woman who had had five husbands and was with a different man that wasn't her husband. What condition were you in? Probably not one that bad. Maybe. But that should tell you something about the mercy of your God. That it didn't matter the condition that you were in. He sent somebody to reach into your life to save you. He gave you his word. He sent his son to die for the sinner. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, in the act of the very sin, Christ died for us. He sent his son to die for all of us, no matter what the condition was. This woman was in a terrible condition, not only in who she was, as that she was unwanted as a human being, but immorally in her life, it was in shambles. Imagine the baggage that comes with somebody who had had five husbands, five, and was with a man that wasn't even her own husband. Imagine the baggage and the brokenness. There's so much behind that story that we don't know that brought her to that place to where she felt she needed five different husbands and then was already moving on to the sixth. And Jesus came to her. What condition were we? She was this Samaritan woman with an immoral past. Was she deserving? Thirdly, have we forgotten what he gave us? Look with me at verse number 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From whence thou, uh, whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. He begins to speak to her about this living water. Did we forget what he gave to us? Let me remind you, first... We were taken to our sin to understand our depravity and the penalty that it required. You came to a point where you realized that you were a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none worthy in this room. There is no one worthy on this earth of the love of God. There is no one worthy of the gift that he gave us on the cross of Calvary. And I tell you, folks, we had to be taken to our sin. At some point, you had to understand your sinful past and your sinful nature to understand just how much Christ had done for you. 
And just as I do when I talk to somebody about the gospel and I give it to them, I, I immediately start with, you have to understand, it's the very first step. You have to know that you're a sinner. He took her to her depravity first. If you notice, Jesus went to this. He said, you, you're right. You've had five husbands. And, then, and the one you're with now is, isn't your husband. He took her to a sin, to her sin. Remember the woman, they, they were, the, the adulterous woman that they were going to stone? Jesus went to her and he protected her. But what did he tell her when he, when, when he sent her off? He said, go and sin no more. We have to be taken to our sin to understand just how depraved we are, folks. If you don't understand the depth of your depravity and how in the eyes of God, how disgusting our righteousness is compared to His righteousness, we don't even begin to understand what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. The scale is so far out of balance for us. We are undeserving of what Christ did for us. For all of sin and can short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. If you've never gone through this, if you've never understood this, I, I beg you, I implore of you to listen to this today. Romans chapter 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. What we earned for the sin that we committed was death. Not only physical death, this human body will die, as will all of us. All of ours. But not only that, that death of our human body because the sin that has entered in, but there is a second death, the Bible says, and that death is death in hell. This, our souls will live forever somewhere, folks. And it says the wages of our sin is death. What we earned, we went to work and we worked hard in our sin. And what we earned was death. Secondly, we learn that there's a Savior named Jesus who loved us more than we could ever begin to understand and purchased our redemption at the cross of Calvary. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. The penalty that we were supposed to pay, Christ Jesus paid for it on the cross. Last, we learn that this living water, which held the gift of redemption for our eternal soul, was offered to us by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But the gift of God, the second half of Romans 6.23 says, but the gift of God was eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He came to you and He offered us a gift. It was a free gift. The only way you don't receive a gift, folks, is by not taking it. If you don't, Jesus offers the living water. You just have to drink it. You don't have to do anything for it. You just have to drink it. The only way you're not going to receive the gift is by not reaching out and taking it. We drank, didn't we? Praise God, I drank. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the gospel. Sometimes we need to be reminded of the plan that we went through and the, the uh, redemption that Christ purchased for us on the cross of Calvary. Dead in our sins, despised and rejected. We were the Samaritans. We were the dogs. We were uh, deserving of nothing. Yet Jesus Christ sent, came to earth, lived 33 and a half years, and died on the cross of Calvary, was there three days, rose again, conquering our sin, conquering death. We trust in him by faith to take us to heaven when we die. That's how we understand the gospel. We drank of that living water. But let me ask you this. Who are you unwilling, unwilling to reach out to? Look with me, if you will, at verse number 27. And upon this he came, came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? This was a woman that wasn't supposed to be associated with. So much so that the very men that walked with Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry... The disciples, the men who reached out, these were the godly men. These are the men who forsook all to follow Christ. These 12 men. These were the 12 men that Christ chose. They were amazed that he would talk with this woman. 
How narrow was their ministry? How narrow was ours? Who are you unwilling to reach out to? Is there a race? They're like, yeah, white people. Hey, white people, leave me alone. Is there a culture, a type of people? Maybe an economic status that you don't associate with? And oftentimes we think, oh, yeah, well, you know, you know, we won't reach out to the poor people. No, I'm talking about rich people, too. How many of us will completely avoid those people? Because we're intimidated or whatever else. So we'll never take them the gospel. We'll only go to the poor, we'll only go to the poor and that's, that's okay, but the rich need Christ, too. Is there a particular culture? Is there a, a neighbor we won't speak with? Is there a bridge that we've burned with a neighbor and as a Christian, as a, as a believer, they will never listen to us or hear us when we speak about our Savior because of the bridge that we burn or because of the relationship that we've created with a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker? Who are you unwilling to reach out to? Where do you draw the line? Who's your Samaritan woman? Barriers between people are the work of Satan. The disciples, Jesus' own disciples... We're amazed that he talked to this woman. I think they were amazed even the fact that um, he was even in Samaria in the first place. But even more so that he's, he's speaking with these women. These are the disciples. These are the strong Christians. These are the men that forsook all. And yet, here they are, surprised that Jesus would speak with this woman. Would you have been willing to enter Samaria? Would you have even gone to the location? How many divine appointments have we missed? How many people have never heard the gospel because we had an appointment that God sent us to and we missed it? Who's your Samaritan woman? Next, look at me at verse number 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to them, Come see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Who are you telling? The Samaritan woman told the whole city. She told everybody. And as a result, many were saved. Here was this woman Jesus came to and he met his appointment with her. This divine appointment. Who knows at what point? In time, it was created. He sits down with this woman at this well and he speaks to her. He reveals many things about her and she's amazed. She was so amazed that she couldn't help but tell. Jesus used this situation to teach his disciples that the harvest was always ripe for the taking. Look with me at verse number 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then come at the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for there are white already to the harvest, to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto unto life eternal, that both he uh, that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap. That whereon ye bestow no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that, I, that ever I did. I think this is amazing about the woman. This woman was so impacted by what Christ had done in her life that she couldn't help but tell people. You know, maybe it's just never really hit us that hard. We complicate evangelism sometimes, and we complicate soul winning. If you burn with the passion and the understanding of what kind of a sinner that you were, and how much Christ saved you from, and if you understood, if you just really even understood what Christ did in your life, you couldn't help but tell people. Such was the case with this Samaritan woman. She sat there and was just amazed She couldn't help. She told the whole city. No doubt. Remember, this is the woman with five husbands. They know her. She's familiar around town, I'm sure. 
But as she goes out and she tells people, they're interested. You know, we don't see this woman. We'll, we, we look later on in the, in the chapter, and it says that, that this woman was not personally the one to win them to Christ. She just brought them to Jesus. We complicate this thing. We make it more about us. But the truth of the matter is we're, lo- we're just bringing them to Jesus. I don't save anybody, folks. I just bring them to Jesus. This woman was so impacted by what Christ had done in her life that she couldn't help but tell. And she went out and she told. And she told everybody. And we see, look, continue with me here. Verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all that, I, that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him, and he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And he said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we heard, of, uh, heard him of ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now, after two days, he departed thence. We see Jesus would spend two days in this city witnessing, winning these people over to him. Imagine giving the gospel to a woman, this depraved Samaritan woman, with the understanding that you, you were the one who was going to die for her sins. This woman, she goes out and she tells everybody she was so impacted, so impacted by Jesus that she couldn't help but tell. But who are you telling? Maybe the problem is it just never hit us hard enough. Jesus was teaching the disciples a lesson in this. The disciples had narrowed their ministry down to a very specific portion of people. And here he was, he goes and he looks at this situation, the Samaritan woman. Jesus was looking out onto a field that had not been harvested. (laughs) And he shows his disciples something here in this story, in this lesson. Don't wait. Don't look around and wait for that situation, wait for that opportunity. As he sat there at the well, he was, and, and he walked out, we see, I, I see almost a very pensive Christ as he's just thinking and understanding this situation with this woman, understanding that he's the one. He is the living water. He goes to his disciples and says, look, the, it, the fields are already ripe, guys. Get out there and reap. But you know, you're never going to do it until you understand what was done. It's not one thing, folks, just to accept the gospel one time and to live with that. Yes, it is one time that we need to accept it to go to heaven when we die. We're set. But like the songwriter said, tell me the old, old story. And in the verse it says, to those who, I love to, I love to tell the story, to those who know it best. When was the last time you dwelled on your salvation? When was the last time you thought about what Christ did for you? And maybe that's the problem. We're just happy with the gift that he gave to us, and that's enough. Now, I'll give it to my kids, I'll give it to my family. You know, if somebody asks, I'll tell them. But... Are there any wells that we're going to go sit down at? Are there any places that we were unwilling to go before that we're going to be willing to start going now? Are there any types of people that we, weren't, we were unwilling to speak with before that we're suddenly going to be willing to speak with? Are there any appointments that are set that we're willing to make Who is it that you're telling? If the gospel has hit you like it's hit me, if you truly understand the depravity of your sin, 
and what Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary, how is it that other people don't know it? How is it that other people don't hear it from your lips? This woman, she couldn't help but tell. She was amazed by what Jesus had done. She couldn't help but tell others. And as we complicate this thing and we think, well, I got to go and I got to go and I got to knock a door and I have to um, set a specific time or maybe I have to invite him out somewhere to coffee or maybe there's a, there's a lot of ways to do it. I'm not knocking any one way, but I'm just telling you, if it's in you, if it's part of you, if you get up every morning with his name on your lips and you think about him and you think about his mercy and you think about his grace and you think about the love that he has for you. And you think about all that he's done for you. You will go out that day and you won't be able to help but tell people. It will just be part of you. Part of your character. Part of your integrity. Part of your heart. Just a piece of your heart. Like I go out and I tell people about my wife. I tell people about my children. I tell people about my Christ. Who saved me. From the depravity that I was in. From the hell that I deserved. Who are we telling? Has it hit you hard enough that you're willing to tell? Is it just enough that you have the gospel and you don't need much more than that? I heard a a man one time who was an atheist, I heard a story about how he said if, if Christians really believed that people when they died went to a place of eternal fire and damnation, wouldn't they crawl on their knees to every single person that they came in contact with to try to save them from that? Ask yourself, when was the last time you told somebody? When was the last time somebody heard the name of Jesus from your lips that wasn't inside of the church? When was the last time you shared your faith? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, I'm convicted even as I preach the words that you've given to me because I'm convicted in my own soul, God, that I'm not doing enough. And God, as we dwell on the story of this woman that you love so much, that you sent your Savior to meet her at this well, God, I'm convicted. I'm convicted of how many appointments maybe I've missed, how many situations, how many people I was supposed to tell of your redemption that you sent through your son. God, I ask that you convict all of us, that we would tell people, that we would tell more people than we're telling now, God. How many people have you specifically given to me to be the steward of their soul, just to, just to give them the truth, just to water it, God. God, I ask as we sit here in this room, I ask that you allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, convict our hearts to do more than we're doing now, God. If you're sitting out there and you don't know, as I went through the different things, I talked about this living water understanding that you're a sinner, understanding that there was a price for that sin, that Christ paid that price. If you don't know 100% sure that you're on your way to heaven, the Bible tells us we can know. But if you don't know that information, if you like to think maybe you are, but you're not 100% sure, but you would like to know, would you just lift up your hand so we can pray for you? We just want to pray for you. I don't see anybody, which tells me I have a room full of believers right now. A room full of people who understand what Christ did for them. When was the last time you told somebody about it? Well, I told, I told somebody once about two, three months ago. Can you tell two, three, four, five? Are you telling me God isn't putting enough people in our path? Are you tell me there's not enough opportunities, there's not enough lost souls. We're not running out of people, folks. God, as I have preached this truth today, I ask that all of us, as together as a church, get more of a burden for lost souls, more of a burden 
for our Samaritan woman. Help us, God, to reach out. Give us opportunities, God. Help us to be faithful stewards. God, send people my way. Give us the confidence to share your son with them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Pastor, I want to say a few words. Well, good morning. What a blessing to see you all. Uh, and I know you're probably saying, who is this guy? I guess maybe about four or five months ago, it's been now, I lose track of time. You know how, you know the ways you find out you're getting old? You can remember 40 years ago, but you can't remember yesterday. I guess about four or five months ago, I handed um, uh, all, all this over to uh, Pastor Gross, and I'm, I'm just sitting back there listening to him preach, and I'm just so excited. I'm so thankful. For those of you that don't know, he's my son-in-law. And uh, he came here years ago, and we had this in mind and in purpose, but we, we let a little time go by because there was some things that we needed to just inject in there. And I listen to him now, and I, I believe he, he has it. You know the message we've just heard. I, I have told him, thank God for anybody that comes to visit our church. We, we thank God for that. But a healthy church and its growth comes from people who are actively telling others about Jesus Christ. That is the sign of a healthy church. And the church is you. The church is me. This Tuesday, uh, I will be directing a funeral for uh, Mrs. Ada Simmons, Chuck Simmons' wife. Um, is, is this online? Do you have this online? Okay, I don't want it online. 